All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Passport Annual Conference. Um, I'd like to start today with a land acknowledgement. I am streaming live from Olympia, Washington, on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Nisqually and Squaxin Island peoples. I did want to let you know that this session is being recorded and will be made available on the WPN website. Um, in order to reduce background noise, all participants are asked to be muted for right now. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please type your question in the chat box located on your control panel. Um, We're also lucky to have Donna Quatch and Alicia Rock, who are acting as our session moderators today, and they will be keeping an eye on that chat function. Later on in this presentation, we'll have an opportunity to go through some case studies, like I mentioned earlier. And at that time, I invite you to unmute yourself and jump into the discussion. We'll just, just talk about what's going on. Um, there are several natural points along the session that will allow me to pause and respond to your questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we're unable to do so because of time, um, just know that I'll reach out to you individually and make sure that your question is answered. You might also notice that there's, there could be a slight delay between the time that your question is submitted and when we receive it. So um, as always, I'm gonna ask for your grace and patience as we walk, work through some of the potential technology, technological speed bumps. Um, you know, this is the first time we're going live Zoom through Passport, so wish us luck. Um, now, I was just looking at the, the list of attendees in this session, and I'm, no I'm noticing that there's a broad range of people with us today, um, and I really want to thank you for, for participating. My name is Dawn Cipriano McCafferty, and I serve as the Assistant Director of the Passport Careers Program, um, Passport to Careers Program with the Washington Student Achievement Council. With that, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm just going to quickly review the information I'll be covering today. Um, of course, I'll be talking about the program expansion. We'll review some program data that was recently collected from institutions. Um, I'll share the budget language for the Passport Student Support Funds and how funds were most commonly used last year. Um, we'll talk about some real life situations that you might encounter with your passport students. And finally, I'll share some information on the resources available for passport student supporters. So um, just really quickly, could you just, so I have a frame of reference that I have an understanding. I want to understand what brought you to this training today. Um, so in what capacity have you been serving foster youth or unaccompanied homeless youth? How long have you been working with Passport students? And about how many students are you serving each year? If you could just go ahead and type that in the chat box. Um, we'll try to pay attention to that, just so we have some kind of frame of reference and that we can share that with each other. So thank you, everyone. Um, with this, I'm just going to talk about really high level information here. Um, this is a little bit of background for those in the audience who may not have, may not know um, that passport eligibility has changed in recent years. The legislature passed a bill that gradually phased in expanded student eligibility for passport. Uh, program changes also included the option for students to pursue either a college credential or an apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship program. Prior to the expansion that began in the 1819 academic year, eligibility for the program was narrow and a limited number of students were supported. A year or so before the program expansion was initiated, House Bill 6274 challenged Washington to become number one in the nation for foster youth, high school graduation, post-secondary enrollment, and post-secondary completion. Washington State could not move the needle without, um, by just serving that small number of students that were previously part of the Passport program. Um, so last July, the Passport to Careers expansion was fully implemented and served students who experienced foster care at any point after their 13th birthday, as well as unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, I also wanted to note that although the program serves students pursuing apprenticeships, this session primarily covers students participating in the Passport to College program. However, Emily um, Sochell from NU is providing apprenticeship training tomorrow. And that's just my little shameless plug here. So aside from what was mentioned on the previous slide, students must also meet this basic criteria. 
Um, students must complete their FAFSA or WASPA and attend an eligible institution in Washington State. Because of Washington's separation of church and state laws, um, students may not pursue a degree in theology. Uh, passport students must be Washington residents and enroll in college prior to, prior to age 22, and their eligibility expires at age 27. Uh, just a quick note here, the age 22 and 27, 27 limitation will likely be amended to align with what is written in the program statute. So it'll probably be age 21 and 26 when we update, update the WAC. Um, this, actually, we just started doing it this week, so that's coming up. Does anybody have any questions about eligibility? And Donna, I can't see the chat, so if you could um, read yeah, any questions. No Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any questions here so far. Mostly people sharing how long this work. Awesome, thank you guys. So we'll move into some data here. Um, this is what I'm most frequently asked about and so I thought I'd share some of this with you. So the program has expanded significantly in a relatively short period of time. Uh, prior to the passport expansion, the number of students Eligible students was limited to those who had been in state foster care for at least one year after their 16th birthday and emancipated from care. Now I added this slide here to make a point. It's not just to show how many students are being served or how much money the state has invested in the program, but also to recognize the work that you as financial aid administrators and support staff are taking on to help the student population, help this population of students. In just a couple of years, you can see that the program has almost quadrupled in size. So that's a significant jump in the number of students that are being served. So this next slide here provides you with a breakdown of the different categories of students served. This is another thing that I've been asked about quite a bit. You know, how many foster, out of, out of all of the students that are being served, how many are foster youth, state foster youth, federal foster youth, tribal foster youth, and unaccompanied homeless youth? So as you can see, there have been increases in each eligibility criteria. The numbers for the 2021 academic year obviously are still incomplete since we are still in the beginning of the academic year. And you know, one of the things that keeps coming up for me is I'm, I'm really curious about how COVID will impact enrollment for our passport students. And so this is something that I'm trying to pay really close attention to. So this, this data here, I, I'm gonna move a little bit backwards and I'll explain why in a minute. This is actually 2018-19 academic um, year information. And this slide provides you with more details around student demographics from um, the unit record reporting in the 18-19 academic year. Now, our unit record report closed on Monday. And so we're not expecting to have that finalized report until the end, probably around the end of this, this, um, this year. So with data collection, we learn and sometimes it opens up more questions, especially for me because I'm always wondering what's going on. <laughs> um, and there are a couple of things here that I wanted to point out. So first of all, the first thing that jumped out to me was that 67% of our passport students were female. And so of course, it's making me wonder what's happening with our, our, our male students, what's, what's going on? How can we help support them? Um, and then another interesting thing was that 18% of the students did not begin their enrollment traditionally during the fall quarter. Um, my question is, was it because of their admissions or was it because their admissions or financial aid um, applications were not completed on time or could it be life circumstances? What, what's the reason for that? Could they have been working on remedial courses at, to prepare them for college? They weren't actually, you know, financial aid recipients at the time. Um, I, I, it's not clear to me yet, but these are things that I want to know. Um, and then when we look at the students year in school, we see that we have quite a few freshmen and sophomores, which isn't surprising because traditionally most of our students attend community colleges. Now, looking at that, I also ask like, what could we do to improve our transfer rate once the student completes their associate's degree or certificate program? Um, you see that students are graduating um, and they are persisting, but what can we do to improve those rates? So this shows some data that was collected from institutions in the 1920 academic year through the passport incentive grant fund reporting process. Um, I'm proud to say that we had 68 graduates. That's pretty awesome, um, but we still have work to do. So it's, but it's, it's still amazing to see this many students be successful. 
Um, on the other hand, we saw that 29% of our students experienced satisfactory academic progress issues for at least one quarter in the academic year. What isn't clear is how many of these students had staff issues as a result of the shifts that were made because of COVID. So more to learn on that. And moving on, um, we asked institutions to share how they identified unaccompanied homeless youth on campus. Um, this is another question that I get, get asked all the time. How are people identifying um, eligible students on campus? And um, so what we found is that most campuses identified eligible students through their financial aid applications or student self-identification. Um, institutions are also working with outside partners such as McKinney Vento Liaisons and non-governmental organizations to identify and serve students. So that's also a very good thing. Oh, let me go back one slide. So in regard to identifying students who had experienced foster care, uh, most institutions identified students through self-identification by the student, um, the uh, institution's applications for financial aid or admissions, and through um, an eligibility list that's provided by WASAC. Again, institutions are working with external partners to serve students, including the K-12 uh, foster care liaisons and community partners such as Setup, Providers, and Treehouse. When asked about how institutions provide outreach and recruitment to prospective students, institutions reported multiple things. Um, they reported that the most effective method, most, the most effective methods were um, meeting one-on-one -on -one with the students. Again, we hear over and over rapport building and building trust is incredibly important with the student population. Um, looping in their supportive adults, such as their set of providers and treehouse advocates. Um, again, that's, that's very important um, to get them involved in the student success. And then another thing that I found really interesting is that during, during this whole COVID closure and the pandemic environment, what I've been hearing from institutions is that students are more responsive to text messages um, because well, I don't know why, but anecdotally, I'm thinking that maybe they have more, <laughs> more time with, that they're not, um, there's less competition for time. And so they can go ahead and respond to the text messages that are being sent out. They're also responding to phone calls and, and direct outreach as well. Again, you know, we're aware that institutions could experience barriers serving passport eligible students. And so we asked about that. Um, and as you can see, there's many different you know, categories here that, that an institution could have said, you know, yes, we're having you know, staff turnover, it's been difficult for us to, to reach out to students just because of, you know, um, heavier burdens of work. But um, the most frequently reported challenge was engaging students. And I, I'm saying that even though I said in the previous slide that students were more engaged through texting and um, phone calls, um, but it is, it's been a challenge getting students to engage in the program. Um, also, they found that students weren't aware of the supports that were available to them, and then faculty and staff on campuses are not, uh, not aware of the program. Student identification continues to be a challenge, um, and recruitment can also be challenging. Uh, the other thing is that there's been a lot of turnover, um, staffing turnover, offices are understaffed, and um, it's, been, it's been difficult to, to juggle with, um, you know, being short staffed and then having this big influx of students that are eligible for the program. Were there any questions that came up about any, or does anybody have any questions about the data that came up? Not, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not seeing anything yet, but I'll let you know, Donna, as questions come up. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So we'll just move on. I'll just go really quickly through these slides. Um, so in order to be eligible for passport, students should submit a consent form. Um, the consent form was updated this year to make it um, more easily read. It is a two-page document now as opposed to being a one-page document in the past, but this a student can fill out online um, and then get submitted to us. 
So they can do this consent form that I have available here. It's also available on our website. There's also a common application um, that a student can complete when they, when they complete their education training voucher uh, program application as well. And that's done online. Um, and then if they indicate that they were in foster care at any point after age 13 on their FAFSA or WASFA, they're also, um, the information is also shared with WASAC so that we can ver verify their information. Um, another thing is that we have been working with the Department of uh, Children, Youth and Families to do a data share agreement. Um, so we uh, collect information from DCYF and automatically enroll students into the Passport program as well. Um, one of the important things here on this, on this consent form is that the student has an opportunity to identify what type of foster care they were in. So were they a state dependent, a federal refugee, uh, or federal uh, foster youth, or were they a tribal dependent? And what that does is it helps us in the office know who to go to to verify their um, foster care status. Um, and accompanied homeless youth do not complete this consent form. There's a, a, an entirely different form for them to complete. So for those students who experience tribal foster, tribal foster care, um, we do ask that they complete this application as well. And again, um, this, we, we don't currently have a data sharing agreement with the 29 federally recognized tribes in Washington state. And so we just ask that this form provided to a, a, an official tribal representative for um, eligibility ver verification. And this tribal official could be a case manager, social service provider, or somebody um, that can verify that the student was in foster care under a tribal court. Um, if you have any questions about that, because I know that there's been some confusion about that, and I understand that every single tribe has different, um, different rules and, and regulations, just go ahead and feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to help you navigate through that. So this slide is showing you the housing questionnaire. And um, what I wanted to point out here is that in most cases, the unaccompanied homeless, homelessness is determined by the financial aid office. So this housing questionnaire is, it's simply a resource. If the financial aid office is saying, you know, we'd like some documentation from the student, feel free to use this. Um, you don't need to verify the information, but you can use this if you need to. Um, if you are in a situation where you're having difficulty determining whether or not the student is qualifying as an unaccompanied homeless, homeless youth, please feel free to refer them to WASAC so that we can do the eligibility, term, eligibility determination. And um, I have a little bullet here that a student's eligibility could change if there's a gap in enrollment. And um, what that means is that if they if they attend fall, winter, drop out spring, come back the following fall, their eligibility for, for passport could need to be redetermined. Um, but if they continuously enroll, um, then you don't need to redetermine their eligibility for passport every year. Don, before you move forward, um, we uh -huh. have a question. Okay. Um, is there a way to check whether a youth has submitted the consent form already or whether Passport has received this information from DCYF or is it easier for on your end for um, the practitioners to just submit it again uh, with the young person just to be safe? You can go ahead and contact us um, and it depends on whether or not you're an institution or if you're a social service provider. If you're a setup provider, we can share that information with you because um, you're contracted with WASAC. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated with organizations that are not contracted wa with WASAC because that information is protected. Unless you have the student's permission to share information, um, we're not able to, to just you know, let you know whether or not the student's eligible. So what I would recommend is um, just contact me first and then we'll navigate through the rest of the um, through the rest of those uh, um, barriers. Is that making sense? I'm waiting for a response, but this person um, said that they work at Treehouse. Okay, okay. Just, if you can give the students permission to share that information, then that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
So I'm referring back to one of the to the data slides that I had mentioned earlier. Um, this helps. You know, I, I'm I'm curious to know how you're finding your your eligible students, um, and what you found to be most effective for you. So again, like I said, you know, you can receive a list from WASAC, um, or if you're in, at an institution, you can receive a list from WASAC. And these will we'll share the information about, you know, who has been determined eligible for passport by DCYF, DSHS, or the tribes, or listed as an unaccompanied homeless youth by your institution. Um, and we, one of the things that we don't share is what category they fall under. So what we'll tell you is you have, you know, Jane Doe is on your campus and they're eligible for passport, but we won't tell you whether or not they're a state dependent, federal dependent, um, tribal dependent, or if they're unaccompanied homeless. So, but we will let you know who is eligible. Um, also check with your admissions or registration materials. You can get that information there. Um, working with your students individually, a lot of times a student will say something that makes you go, oh, hey, hold on one second. Let's talk about this a little bit more. Let's find out if you're eligible for this program. And then um, work with your setup providers and other student support organizations, just like, like Treehouse. Um, and, you know, they oftentimes can be your, your best resource for referrals. So um, I hope that helps. And regarding student support. So one of the truly unique things about the Passport program is the comprehensive nature of its services to students. It does not only provide a scholarship, but it also provides an avenue for student support services that are financially supported by flexible funds front, flexible funds uh, from the state of Washington. Um, to participate, an institution must sign an addendum to the regular participation agreement for state financial aid programs. And this addendum requires institutions to develop a viable student support plan that is framed by four primary components. And um, the first component is a campus leadership commitment. So we have somebody in a VP position or a president on campus that says, yes, this is important. It's important to serve the passport population of students on campus and I will do what I need to do to help make sure that they have um, what they need or that our designated support staff has what they need in order to, to best support these students. Um, and then that moves on to the second bullet. We ask the institutions to designate a support staff person on campus. And what this means is that there is one person on campus that I can contact or that a student can contact or that CSF can contact and say, hey, you know, I've got Jane Doe here and she needs some support on you know, for, for tutoring or counseling or whatever it is. And this designated support staff person can say, all right, I know how to connect them to this person. Um, so I like to call them the air traffic controllers on campus. It's not that they need to be the expert in all topics and everything passport, but if they know what's going on in their community on their campus, then they, they, can, they can help refer that student to um, the support that they need. We also ask that institutions rever review a student's financial aid package to make sure that they they are most um, that that they are packaged as fully um, as they can possibly be. Uh, of course, you know we we don't want students to you know really be relying on loans. There are a, a, a ton of resources for for foster youth on campus, and so um, we want to make sure that they're accessing Washington College grant. Passport, you know, if possible, governor scholarship or um, education training voucher program. And then, um, like I'd mentioned before, make sure you're connecting with the social service, so social services, and independent living providers. Set up staff, you know, treehouse staff on your in in your community, so that um, you know what is available out in your community community um, to support students. So this slide is an actual clip from the budget language um, that describes how student support funds, what we used to call this in incentive grants, how those funds can be used to support students. So what you'll see here is that um, the language is pretty broad. And um, so those institutions who have submitted their addendum qualify for student support funds for the recruitment and retention of passport students. The passport designated support staff on campus Campuses report that funding has been invaluable to improve the coordination of services and involvement with community-based programs. Building rapport with passport students early is essential and especially helpful during a time of crisis. And we definitely saw that um, during the pandemic. 
Institutions report that funding has allowed designated support staff to offer food with activities, provide resources that are unique to students from foster care or unaccompanied homeless youth. Some common uses of passport student support funds include targeted services such as financial planning seminars, private study areas, and access to computer labs, special orientations and welcome functions, and access to additional pre-enrollment academic um, personal and career services. Passport students may also, passport student support funds may also be used for general purposes. These purposes could include emergency loans, wages for staff, textbooks for a lending library, um, a resource loan library that included computers and other electronic equipment. Um, we saw a lot of institutions get hotspots for students that were um, learning online this year. Um, they can also do things like get uh, gift cards to grocery stores, gasoline or transit passes to help with transportation costs, um, college survival backpacks and school supplies, healthy snacks, warm socks or clothes, um, hats, boots, gloves, all kinds of things, um, helps with medical billing, housing expenses, housing expenses and testing fees. Now, one thing I do wanna note here is that if an institution uses support funds to award a student a gift card or gas card or another, another source of cash assistance, it could be considered a resource for financial aid purposes. So I definitely suggest that you work with your financial aid um, staff on your campus. So with the incentive grant um, reporting last year, we did collect information about how institutions used their um, student support funds in the 1920 uh, 20 academic year. And what you can see here is that the student support funds were mostly spent on school supplies like library books and technology. Um, lots of emergency funding for students, especially this past year. Um, and, and, and a lot of that had to do again with the COVID um, pandemic and, and what students were experiencing around that. Um, another high request is, you know, food, groceries, gas cards, those types of things. And um, this year already, we've, we've received requests for things such as um, helping a student with short-term housing, an unaccompanied homeless youth with short-term housing. So, um, the institution was able to do that. And then another institution asked about getting an interpreter for a student that was struggling um, with the English language. And so that was approved as well. So this slide just shows you multiple sources of student support for passport students. First, as I had mentioned, as I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, passport student support funds, um, you know, they can be used flexibly. And um, if you ever have any question on how they can be used, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to you know, provide you with some guidance, give you an official approval, yes, this is good, or um, redirect some of the thoughts that you have about how uh, you'd like to support the students. Uh, the College Success Foundation also has some emergency funding for passport students through their Emergency Scholar Success Fund, which is what um, Juliet had opened up our, our um, conference with today. Um, when she had said that they were able to redirect about $100,000 of um, funds to help support passport students. Um, in addition to scholarships, WASAC, WASAC also provides outreach and support to students through direct email and texting campaigns. Um, we use something called the OtterBot, which if you don't know about it, I'm happy to tell you about it later. Um, it's something that is used through the 12th year campaign. Um, and Passport has also tapped into it as well. And finally, uh, Washington State was lucky, lucky enough to be selected for funding provided through the Stewart Foundation. Um, this funding is administered through an organization called Together We Rise, which is located in, in California. Um, if your organization is interested in participating as a referral agency, um, please contact me and I am happy to get you the application and help walk you through that process as well. So I did uh, want to talk really quickly about the Passport Leadership Team. Um, the team meets on a quarterly basis to support things such as this conference, um, other training opportunities, the webinars. Um, we do policy development, data collection and evaluation, and other projects. It's made up, about, made up of about uh, 30 members from a whole breadth of uh, backgrounds, including institutions, social service agencies, um, state agencies, apprenticeships, and tribes. 
So um, this just gives you a really quick idea of some high level things that we've, we've been working on with the Passport Leadership Team. Um, and looking forward to more of the work that we're doing this year. So I've briefly mentioned the setup program throughout this presentation. Um, it's actually the starting point for the Passport program as it begins working with students at age 13 and continues working with them through age 21 uh, or their first year of college. Um, there were six organizations contracted with WASAC throughout the state of Washington, and they serve about 350 students each year in developing their post-secondary plans, whether it's going to college, um, working, or um, going into the service. So the Passport Apprenticeship Program is administered through a contract that WASAC has with an organization called ANU. Um, this program provides support to passport eligible students pursuing either an apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship and helps cover expenses for uh, things like tuition fees, work clothes, rain gear, boots, and other occupation related tools. And then this slide is just gonna tell you really quickly um, a little bit of background information about ANU. Um, this, uh, they were founded in 1980, uh, specifically for women in non-traditional pathways, um, but they serve both men and women. And the apprenticeships covered includes manufacturing, construction, healthcare, IT, and there's a, there's a, there's a broad service area. Um, and whether or not the student is in the Puget Sound region, you know, they'll work with students that are in Eastern Washington or, um, South, South, Southwest Washington, um, they'll try to get students connected to where they need to be. Um, and then I did want to provide Emily's contact information. If you have any students that are interested in pursuing an apprenticeship program, um, feel free to reach out to Emily. She's fabulous to work with. All right, you guys ready to work? Let's do some student scenarios. So, um, but before we move on to the student scenarios, I want to pause for any questions again. Donna, did anything come up? Nothing has come through the chat um, since okay. Donna asked the first question. Okay, thank you so much. I know I'm breezing through this really quickly, so feel free to stop me. Um, okay, so I've developed five student scenarios for us to go through. And before we move into the case studies, I wanna invite you to unmute yourselves so that we are able to work through these scenarios together. Um, just know that this is about learning. Um, there are no mistakes because we are in a learning environment. However, if you are an expert in an area, please feel free to share your ex area of expertise. I mean, this is, this, is, um, this is what this is all about, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with this first student. So your student was living in, the in a car, a student, your student was living in their car during their senior year of high school and received the Passport to Career Scholarship for the first year of college. Thanks in part to their financial aid award, they were able to rent an apartment and have signed a lease. So tell me, um, are the, is the student continuing to be eligible? What's going on here? How would you determine the student's eligibility? What would you be, um, how would you provide, be providing student, the student with the support that they need? So feel free, go ahead, unmute. I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, oops, sorry, back. Come back on camera and hopefully I don't distract myself. Okay. Anybody want to jump in? I'm going to start calling on people. <laughs> Rosie, I saw your two cute little grandchildren pumpkin pictures. So what would you do if this was your student? Would they continue to be eligible for passport? How would you work through um, the student scenario uh, to have them to determine whether or not they were eligible? Why do you gotta call on me? <laughs> they saw your cute little pumpkins. <laughs> I knew you were gonna call. <laughs> now this is where I thought they were were able to receive it the second year because it wasn't. <sighs> Sorry, brain fart. <laughs> um, they were because they were still part of the program. I thought yeah. you guys were allowing that to to process in. in my yeah. Right or wrong? Yep, Jamie, do you want to, Jamie okay. from 
Hi, do you want to jump in? Do you want to say anything? Hi, about everybody. This? So, Hi. yeah. Um, I'm like, I don't you... like being put on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, once you um, um, do professional judgment on a student and mark them as a homeless youth, they're a homeless youth for an entire year. So, they would still remain eligible for that academic period. But as Don was saying, the caveat is for homeless youth determination, they do have to do that professional judgment every academic year for financial aid in order to stay in that status. Or if there's a break in attendance and they come back, yes, you would have to relook at yeah. it. So for financial aid purposes, but I want clarification on that, Don. Now you said if they yeah. did leave, would we have to resubmit the homeless youth question to you guys when they came back in order to give them? Or would they stay in the same, if they left, let's say they attended fall, took winter off and came back spring. Yeah. For the passport piece, would we have to ask for permission again? Um, the same you know, academic it's year? In the, it's in the same academic year, so I would say that they're okay. But if it's from one academic year to the next, so if they, if they drop spring, come back fall, yeah. um, then you know you would have to do a new all year. over again yeah. yeah okay yeah that makes sense to me so okay. you can see like the student in this scenario they used their financial aid and they were able to secure an apartment so they signed a lease typically what i say is if a student is on a lease or whatever then they, they probably are not considered unaccompanied homeless um however the student was determined unaccompanied homeless in the year prior they continued their enrollment so they're going to continue to be eligible for passport um, so that's what's going on in this scenario. So they have stable housing, continued their enrollment, they're still eligible for passport. Does anybody have any questions about this scenario? Okay. You ready for the next one? We'll move on to case two. So a student received the passport scholarship as an unaccompanied homeless youth for five quarters of college before taking spring quarter off. They return to school the following fall and have a 12 month lease on, a, on an apartment. What's going on here? Somebody jump in. I'm going to say no on this one. So she could still do a dependency override with financial aid because she still doesn't have the parent support but she has stability. Fantastic. So no for passport, but yes for financial aid. Yeah, and the student could qualify for, you know, Washington College Grant or some other, some other support, um, but for passport, they would not be eligible anymore. Not unless they lost their housing again or, and, and you know, we're at, we're at risk of homelessness. So that was an easy one because we kind of went over it with the slide before. So this one is going to get a little bit more complicated. So you know, who's brave enough to jump on this one, okay? So a student was a dependent of the Oregon Child Welfare System and was placed with her aunt in Washington when she was a freshman in high school. In the student's best interest, she was permitted to continue attending her high school in Oregon and graduated. So um, is the student eligible for passport? And, and uh, I think Peggy, you might be in this, you might be, I think I saw your name in here. Uh, Peggy Carlson from OSPI. What what do you think for this scenario? Oh, put me right on the spot. Why don't <laughs> you? <laughs> um, okay, student dependent of Oregon child welfare placed with her aunt when she was freshman in high school. So is she eligible for passport? Is yeah. that what you're asking me? Yes. I would say yes because she lives in she lives in Washington, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would say. <laughs> Does anybody anybody else want to jump in on this one? Any financial aid people? I don't know who else is in here. I can't see. Thank you, Peggy. I have one question in the chat, Don, from Brian yeah. Davidson asking, yeah. is this an ICPC agreement? There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, so this is the student that is placed in an interstate compact. Um, it's called the interstate compact of the placement of children. So what happens is the state of Oregon, she's a dependent of the state of Oregon. Um, she, she's placed in Washington because that's where she's most suitably housed. 
Um, she's graduating from a Washington high school. She's a resident of Washington State. She's still in foster care. Um, and so yes, she does qualify for the passport program. These get complicated um, and we see them, especially in areas where, you know, there's like border towns like at Clark College or um, near the Idaho border or Oregon border. Um, but yeah, this is something that could happen. And way back when the program was first starting, we used to see a lot of students who were from the California system, but placed in Washington state. And in the past, we weren't able to serve them. Now we are able to do that. So yeah, nice work, you guys. All right, case four. Your student disclosed that they are undocumented and experiencing foster care in Washington and experienced foster care in Washington during middle school. They signed up for the college bound scholarship program and what would like to attend college. So what what would have to happen here? What what advice would you give the student? What would they need to do? Can't see. You know what, Brian, since you asked the question, I'm gonna pick on you this time. What what would you do here with this student? I put in the chat, I'd have him uh, complete the WAFSA. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Brian. So this student, um, they were in foster care in middle school. Uh, presuming that they were in foster care at age 13, um, they would then complete their, their WASPA application uh, rather than their FAFSA application. Um, and then they could be eligible for college bound, Washington College Grant, and Passport. Hey, Don, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think with Passport to Apprenticeship, you don't have to fill out WASPA. So if they wanted to do Passport to Apprenticeship too, then they could just get connected with, with the person who organizes it, like me. Yes, and you guys would do the financial determination and all of that stuff, right? Yes, I'm just yeah. saying they wouldn't necessarily have to fill out WASPA if they wanted to go the apprenticeship route. Yep, absolutely. All right, and we're working our way to our last scenario. So this student, this passport student is in her third year of college and is doing well academically, but her laptop is aging and is starting to make it difficult for her to log on to her online classes, which is causing her anxiety. So I'm going to ask our DSSs, our designated support staff, um, who are in this call or in this training, what would you do to support the student? What, how could you help the student? Don, I can take a stab with that one. This is Malcolm. Hi, Malcolm. And we do have, um, for uh, laptops that's allotted just for passport, um, you know, to career student. So yeah, that's what we would do. So what you're saying is that you used your, your passport student support funds to purchase yes. laptops. Yeah. So you have a technology bank basically on campus yes. that you can loan those out to students. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And this is Brian, uh, we, just, we just buy him one. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing that's totally permissible. I love buying computers. <laughs> how do you do, that's one of my questions is how do you do it? Do you go on Amazon? Do you have a purchase order? Do you have a contractor that you work with specifically? Or how, how do yeah, you do um, it? I, actually the easiest way has been for me to uh, shop online with the student, find something that works, do the purchase order. And then I get uh, the, um, the debit card from our business office and just do it directly online that way. Perfect. And there are lots of different ways. Um, there's, there's no real wrong way. Um, so I, you know, I see colleges do it in many different ways. And Malcolm, what you're, what you're talking about is also awesome. Um, having a technology bank on campus, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so now my second question here is what about her anxiety? What would you, what would you do to help her there? And we know this is happening right now. <laughs> I'll give it a stab. Hi, my name is Sunita, she, her, hers. Um, and as a coach, I would actually use the training model I've gone through to just assess how much of a level of anxiety it is, as much as try to come up with coping strategies that she comes up with on her own. Awesome. I also um, think most schools have resources like mental health counselors or possibly a wellness um, dedicated person, like a health and wellness coach 
Um, I know we have an ASWCC program that uh, promotes um, exactly helping students to peer mentor each other. So I'd offer um, links or resources or, or, or like worksheets for her to get connected to those spaces. Fantastic. And Sunita, where, what, where are you from? What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm with uh, uh, Brian. Um, I'm at Welcome Oh, Community. awesome. Okay. Hi. Um, I would also add that, you know, we might also just uh, run a little Zoom meeting with them and, and let them screen share and walk them through it. Just walking through it might, might get rid of that part of the anxiety too. Yeah, that's true. Hi, Sunita. <laughs> yeah, again, it's about that rapport building and it's about that trust building and all of that kind of stuff. We, we've found that, um, you know, students are more successful when they have a good rapport. Um, so yeah, definitely. Oh. Brian, she's waving at you. All right, did anybody want to add anything else? Have you, have you guys come into any scenarios where you know, you'd like to talk through it right now with, you, with other professionals? Um, if, if you do, happy to share, happy to you know, work hi, with you on that. I'm, hi, I'm Inja Parker. Hi, Inja. Hi, uh, we at Green River have uh, a designated counselor so we, yeah, we can direct uh, the student to the designated counselor, so she would help. The Perfect. Out, so. so this person is, um, so they're, they're a designated counselor for um, passport students, or you know, what, what's, what's their um, case would look like? The counselor is a regular school counselor for everybody, <laughs> but uh, we have a few counselors, so one of them is designated for passport students. So Excellent. we have Yahar on the board. Perfect, thank you for sharing. All right, and we're gonna move on to other resources. So um, this screen just shows you really quickly, this is a passport program manual. Um, this is, it's primarily for financial aid administrators. However, we're working on expanding this to make it um, more available to more populations. So the DSS will be able to use it. Um, hopefully our partners will be able to use it, our external partners. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of information in here. It has, uh, you know, passport student guide, outreach flyers uh, on, the, on the student website. Um, we have a whole list of frequently asked questions that we're constantly updating, always checking these, these materials that are, that are posted on our website. Um, then on the Ready, Set, Grad website, we have, um, it's more student friendly, but it also can be helpful to administrators because it has passport institution contact, a, a contact list. So there's a link on the website that says de designated support staff. If you click on that link, it'll show you everybody who's participating in the passport um, viable plan or student support plan. And um, just know that you have these people as resources as well. So if you're working with some a student and you're struggling trying to figure out, you know, how to best serve the student, look at look at the campuses that are around you and and talk to your colleagues and see like, hey, you know, what what are you doing? If you have you ever run into a situation like this, how are you? How would you serve the student? Talk to each other because it does help. Um, and then the Washington Passport Network website which is actually run by the College Success Foundation. Um, there's documents there like the agreement to participate, the passport, um, the student support guide. So that helps you come up with ideas for how you can best support students. Um, and that's another document that was um, done. Actually, Brian Davidson from Whatcom led that effort with the passport leadership team. So um, that's a really, it's a really helpful document. Um, and then it also has the, passport designated support staff and financial aid administrator role descriptions. So it's, it's not these written like job descriptions, but they're not exactly job descriptions. It's, it's like if this were my world and everything were the way I wanted it to be, our DSS and our FAAs would do this for our passport students. So it, it gives you an idea of um, the ideal situation for serving passport students. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the passport, the current WAC and the current statute are kind of misaligned right now because of the expansion of the program. And so what we're doing, um, we're currently working on is, expand, or is, is modifying that WAC to better align it with what 
the program statute says. So um, just know that we're going to be reaching out to institutions and to the, to the passport leadership team um, to get some feedback on what, what we're writing. And this is probably, there's gonna be policy, in, um, policy support, there's gonna be some definition support that we're gonna need. So just know that this is coming. And we do have a, we were ambitious saying that we wanted this in winter 2021, but I don't think that's gonna happen um, just because we have legislative session coming up and things are gonna probably get to be pretty busy. But we have started working on it actually this week and um, you can fully expect to see that coming your way as well. So you'll have an opportunity to provide feedback. <clears throat> so um, in the spring, let me see here, I don't wanna go backwards. All right, so we, there are several trainings that are offered, um, just how this one is you know, offered, it, we've done it through Zoom and they're posted on the Washington Passport Network YouTube channel. And there's a link there that you can link to, um, you can click on and, and get to all the trainings that were offered in the past year. Um, we also, WASAC did a financial aid training in the in spring of 2020. And so you can learn all about Washington College Grant, uh, Passport, all kinds of different programs that are, that are administered through the state of Washington <clears throat> and um, state work study programs. You can click on that link there and you'll see um, the, the recorded webinars posted. And then this last, the science of theory and hope, creating a meaningful pathway for youth. This is something that I just wanted to share with, with you because um, it was actually part of the Gear Up conference last week. So the Gear Up West conference last week. And the gentleman that ran this, he had been um, an unaccompanied homeless youth. He had spent some time in foster care and he's now uh, a PhD in Oklahoma. He does research on hope and um, how that impacts a student. And so the training is about a half an hour long. Um, I watched it, I was totally impressed by what he had to say and it gave me a different perspective. And then of course I forced my family to watch it because I thought it was useful to them as well. Um, so I'm just sharing this with, with you because um, I think it's, it's just good, good information to have. Hey, Don, can you go yes. back for a second? This, yep, sure. Can you stick those links in the chat box? Because I can't sure. click on them on my screen. <laughs> Alicia or Donna, could you help with that? Yes, I'll have to open up your PowerPoint for a moment, but I will drop those in the chat. And then okay. as you're moving on to the contacts, we also have one question in the chat for Emily. Emily, if you're comfortable sharing your contact information, if you could drop that in the chat too, that would also be great. Or I can share what I have from your email signature. Oh yes, absolutely. I can, I'll add it now. Emily, what time are you presenting tomorrow? I believe it's 1030, but I have to double check. <laughs> okay. So just know that Emily will be presenting tomorrow on apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships. Um, so, you know, jump in if you, if you have any questions. She's, she's, again, like I said, she's fabulous to work with and um, knows a lot of stuff. Thank you, Dawn. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, I've said many times, contact me throughout the presentation. So um, here's my contact information. Uh, Calvin, our program coordinator, he's also uh, wonderful to work with. And then Carla, who's our senior associate director for our need-based programs in, um, at, in our SFA division here at WASAC. Um, she's also wonderful to work with. So here's all of our contact information and feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions about Passport, we're happy to, happy to help. And with that, were there any other questions? I think we're out early, you guys. But I think I think we'll wrap it up. Anything coming up in the chat? No. Gratitudes. No. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us. And um, we will end early if there are no more questions. And then we'll see you all at two thirty for the regional group breakout sessions. Um, so you just go ahead and follow the, follow the link that you received via email, and um, we'll see you at 2.30. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. It was good to see you.